And then uh, I was telling him about this, the TV thing, which he had no idea about. And uh, he said, oh, is that why you have makeup on? And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I do still have it on my face. And he said, yeah, I noticed. I just thought you were trying a new thing. And I was like, <laughs> what? What's going on, podcast listeners? Welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me, as always, Cole Swanson. Cole, what's going on, my man? I am doing great. I think I might have lost some brain cells from the fumes in here, though. Brain cells? Yeah. And mm. that thing? Never heard of them. <laughs> Got none of that. From uh, the smells you told me about from the freshly coated paint on yeah. the studio walls? A little uh, painting done in here. It looks great. Mm. Thanks, man. Always improving. That's right. Wait till you guys see the metal that's going to be installed <laughs> the to metal. hold up the uh, studio lighting. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's coming. Wife is really excited about that move. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. Thank you, Amazon. Shout out. It's going to be cool. So if you're watching the video version, stay tuned for that we'll nonsense eventually. If, if you see any um, lights on the ground, those will soon be suspended. I see them. In the air. Yeah, instead of on the ground where yeah. you can't see them and they're not useful. <laughs> yeah. Except for blinding us. We had to turn them off today because they're literally just putting light right into our eyes they're very bright so maybe we're gonna have to like wear makeup or something mm, maybe you know? not <laughs> it's a no-go it's a no-go <laughs> so this is a true story speaking of that so uh like two episodes ago the right before we recorded the episode i had done a uh like a super quick thing on tv like abc for this uh opioid addiction um interview like a uh, panel that they were doing now you can and check it out online he's famous now so it's definitely, definitely not true. But, um, anyways, so I had they forced me to wear makeup for this thing on TV because like, literally like, held them down and stretched. And they were like, "You have to because you're gonna look like you have are super ill if you don't have this makeup on." So I was like, "Fine, I'll wear makeup." And so I was in such a hurry because once we finished, I had to leave straight from there and come home and record because Cole was gonna we were scheduled to record that night. So I and we plus we had a guest on and all that. So I had this makeup on my face, didn't look in the mirror, came home. Cole saw me record. We recorded this podcast. All this was over, and then uh, I was telling him about this, the TV thing, which he had no idea about. And uh, he said, "Oh, is that why you have makeup on?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess I do still have it on my face." And he said, "Yeah, I noticed. I just thought you were trying a new thing." And I was like, <laughs> "What?" So I was just like a little offended that uh, he just thought that was just my new thing. I was just going to try start wearing makeup. Well, nowhere. I was like, you know, you know, Mike, he wants to look good for the podcast. Yeah, you never we know. videotape. You know, we have a huge YouTube following, so he just wanted to look good under the lights. Yeah, I mean, you know. And, and you know, no offense if you're, you know, like to wear makeup, good for you. Probably look a lot better than the rest of us. But uh, I just feel like that, you know, was rude of him to just to assume that's my new thing. Yeah, Mike's not a makeup wearing guy. No, nah, sure. no, nah, it's not going to, makeup's not going to fix this. <laughs> it is what it is. All right. What are we talking about tonight? We are talking about atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis. Doing another derm topic that we're not qualified to talk about. Why not? Uh, I think the last one was acne. I don't know if we've done... Oh, we did psoriasis. I think that's it. Mm hmm Yeah. We did psoriasis. has been like uh, quite a while ago, I think. Yeah. They've both been a while. So we're due. We're due. We hit all the systems and we just kind of rotate, you know? Mm hmm That's all you can really do. Via the dartboard. <laughs> Via the dartboard. <laughs> you just throw a dart. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yep. Uh, and it's just us tonight. No just guests. Just us. No guests. Got no Pete. Got no Steve. Nothing. Yeah, what the heck? Pete's still not here. I know. Pete's fired. He's not in Germany, though. Yeah, yeah he's not in Germany. You, so you guys enjoy, hope you enjoyed Pete's one episode because he's fired. <laughs> hope he's listening. No severance package. None. Nothing. So, atopic dermatitis. We're going to kind of go through some brief intro stuff, talk about the pathophys a little bit, and then we will kind of talk about why, you know, why it's important and then some of the treatment options and, uh, Kind of close with what else is coming on the horizon, I guess. Yep. Uh, and so it's a it's a chronic, pruritic, so itchy, inflammatory skin disease, um, seemingly of unknown origin. We'll talk about the patho. It's not super clear, but they have some theories. Uh, it frequently begins in infancy, uh, but also affects a substantial number of adults. Uh, it's it's kind of non-specific when you're trying to diagnose it, especially because it usually just starts with itchy skin. So you got a kid coming in saying, "Hey, my skin itches," uh, and there's a lot of other things that it could be, um, like scabies, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, contact dermatitis, other things like that. 
uh, psoriasis. It could be something more serious like a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So you got to tease all that out, um, and eventually you may get other symptoms uh, that come along with it, which we'll go through. Um, it It's part of something I think is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of times patients who have atopic dermatitis will go on to have other issues with allergies and asthma, like uh, food allergies, asthma, allergic rhinitis. As they go throughout their life, they'll struggle with this. And you probably knew people like this. Um, whenever I think of it, I think of um, Jimmy Neutron. And I can't even remember the, uh, there was the three, and then there was the guy who was a little larger, and he was allergic to everything. And uh, he had itchy skin, and he was always blowing his nose and stuff like that. There's people who, you know, it's like, man, why do you have so many allergies? I feel sorry for you. And these all kind of go together. And they think that um, one of the more prominent theories is it has to do with elevated levels of IgE, immunoglobulin E, uh, which kind of um, uh, adds to all the other allergy issues that they'd have throughout their life. Um, There also seems to be a genetic component as well. Um, For instance, there is certain loss of function mutations that can happen in what they call the filigrin gene or the FLG. Um, it's That's directly involved with skin barrier function. Um, and it seems to be uh, this loss of function mutation seems to be a major risk factor for developing atopic dermatitis. Um, and there's others as well, but uh, there's definitely a genetic component. They've done studies where um, children with one atopic uh, parent will have a two to three-fold increase of developing atopic dermatitis themselves. Um, and then if the, both parents have it, there seems to be a three to five um, time increase mm. of having atopic dermatitis. So definitely a genetic component as well. It is pretty common overall. Oh, and his name was Carl, by the way, Jimmy Neutron guy. Oh, uh, yeah. It is pretty Carl. common overall. About 10 to 12% um, of children will have some sort of atopic dermatitis and a, around a little less than 1% of adults. Uh, but some other symptoms other than just itchy skin would be uh, xerosis, which is a dumb way of saying dry skin, um, lichenification, uh, kind of rubbery skin, which I feel like comes from itching, but I guess it can just arise from the disorder itself. Um, eczematous lesions. Um, frequently, it's early onset of age. I mentioned that. It, it's chronic, but a lot of times it relapses and then flares up, uh, which we'll talk about that in the treatment. So you'd want to use certain things during relapse to prevent a flare-up, then use other things during a flare-up potentially. Uh, and yeah, they're more prone to staph infections, and that kind of uh, plays a role throughout the course of this disease as well. Yeah, definitely can lead to some social insecurities as well, especially because this is very prevalent in children, um, and because it shows up on the skin, kids, you know, I don't know if you were ever a, a kid uh, in high school, or especially like in middle school, but kids can be ruthless, and uh, oh, really? it, it can lead to a lot of... Uh, a lot of problems with with anxiety and, and social discomfort with uh, with children that have problems with eczema, especially in areas that are very visible. Um, they did a meta analysis um, and t- came out this year in February, so last month, where they looked at um, basically thirty seven different observational studies and found that uh, children with eczema. Um, or atopic dermatitis, um, have nearly twofold increased risk of depression and suicidal ideation, um, and same with adults as well, um, compared to individuals without the disease. So definitely uh, something to be kind of screening for. If Even if you're in a dermatology mm-hmm. office, I'll always make sure that you're giving the, the, the patients a PHQ-2 at least, or a PHQ-9, um, or some other form of uh, deciding whether or not the person may have some symptoms of depression and kind of keeping that in the, the back of your mind because definitely seems to be correlated. Yeah, unfortunately, I think sometimes I was that ruthless person. Were you? I like to think that I wasn't, but you, you seem know, like a bully. It ha- I know. I'm, I'm a bullyish kind of guy, aren't I? What's ridiculous is I was actually a big old dork in like, middle school. <laughs> really? And, yeah, so I'm more of the sarcastic to... bully now. And then, That's yeah. why you decided to beat people up for a living. I guess, yeah, yeah, just total taking insecurity. On, taking on those bullies. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to beat me up anymore. <laughs> no more wedgies. No more swir- Do people do that anymore? Wedgies and swirlies? Couldn't tell you. I don't think they do. You know, you never. I feel like nowadays you'd end up on CNN if you were doing that. You probably would. Yeah. Who knows? Interesting. Yeah, it's probably not great. Great idea if you're thinking about trying it. There's gonna be a whole generation that has no idea what a swirly is. 
I never had one, so yeah. actually, I really don't know either. I just, yeah. I've heard about them. Heard they are not super fun. Yeah, so. I don't think so. Uh, but we talked a little bit about patho. So yeah, IgE elevation, prominent theory. Um, uh, a common secondary theory is that there's a primary defect in uh, the epithelial barrier. Uh, so that can lead to other secondary immunologic dysregulation uh, and inflammation causing the symptoms that you will inevitably hopefully treat. So, what do we do when a patient actually has a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis? You know, this is something that they're going to have to deal with in their life. So, how do we kind of treat the symptoms, uh, prevent these flare-ups, if you will, and, uh, you know, help them to live a somewhat normal life? And it's one of those things that there's several different approaches that we need to take to, to care. Everything from using certain moisturizers to bathing practices uh, to actual medications to bring down any kind of uh, redness, swelling, itching uh, symptoms as they as that kind of breaks out. Mm-hmm. So, And even certain clothing and certain diets can help prevent yep. or lessen a flare. And fortunately, this, uh, a flare-up does not usually require emergency therapy, though some patients may go to the emergency room in some uh, situations where they might have an infection or it's worse than a regular flare. Uh, but yeah, like Mike said, first line, you want to moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. Um, so depending on the climate, uh, patients usually benefit from lukewarm baths. So like a five-minute lukewarm bath um, followed by the application of a moisturizer, such as a white petrolatum. Uh, aquaphor is pretty common. You've probably seen that around. Um, frequent baths with the addition of emulsifying oils, uh, like one cap full of that in the lukewarm bath for five to 10 minutes that can help hydrate the skin. Uh, apparently the oil keeps the water on the skin and prevents evaporation to the outside environment. Um, this sounds like stuff that you would see on like a, like a Neutrogena commercial or something, but apparently it, if it helps with symptoms, it's all mainly a symptomatic disorder, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so to just to kind of give a few, since you mentioned Neutrogena, let's give a few like name brands of um, common moisturizers or cleansers that are out there that um, either have clinical trials or are recommended to be used in dermatology. And these are all going to be things that are um, hyper, hypoallergenic um, and safe to use in dermatitis. But there's like Aquaphor is the big one um, that like Cole, I think mentioned earlier. Um, Vanacream is another one that you'll see. Uh, Eucerin is one. Um, Cetaphil. And there's a moisturizing cream and a skin cleanser that Cetaphil puts out. Um, there's a vino lotion, um, and then Dove Bar Soap, um, unscented, is another one that that uh, is available. And I think we, I believe we talked about this in the psoriasis podcast because I think that was the study was actually looking specifically at psoriasis. But they've actually done studies um, looking at like the bars of soap compared to each other and that um i believe that the dove unscented one was one of them that they studied and um compared to like a regular just soap and um seemed to actually control the symptoms a little bit better for uh, someone with psoriasis so the i would imagine the same effects could be extrapolated to atopic dermatitis as far as the itchiness and whatnot yeah mike can speak from experience he uses dove soap every night it's true <laughs> Actually, I think I used Dove for mint body wash. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to ask your wife which one you use, and then we're going to call you out on it for making fun of me. I, I, I Dove for mint body wash and uh, Suave, or as my old roommate used to say, Suave for men uh, shampoo. Heck yeah. It's the only way to roll. <laughs> um, yeah, and those are all over the counter, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Which is interesting because I, they can be dispensed as a prescription, but I get that question frequently, like what what kind of, you know, what what's the best lotion? And I'm... A lot of times I'm like, oh, if it says moisturizer, just just use it. Uh, but it, it kind of depends. So if it's this situation, ointments are actually going to be better. Ointments are more easily applied to wet skin, and you do want to apply it um, to at least damp skin to try to um, hold in that moisture. So yeah, if you if you think this is a atopic dermatitis picture, then recommend one of those brands, specifically ointments, um, help. Uh, and yeah, so th- there's an answer instead of just sending somebody down the whole aisle to pick out what looks <laughs> pretty. Pick one. Yeah. It's got tons of allergens in it. It makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, th- um, there's also, we should probably mention too, um, this may seem a little obvious, but you would want to eliminate any kind of exacerbating factors. So looking for things that could be triggers for the, the breakout, such as like heat, um, real low humidity, 
Um, if, uh, you know, a person has a skin infection, we would obviously want to treat that very quickly. Um, if the person is just having like out of control itching, you know, you can use oral antihistamines, um, stress and anxiety can also play a role. So things like uh, if the person is having multiple symptoms, you know, maybe you could use something like hydroxyzine to help with the anxiety as well as the control of itching. Um, so trying to find this, you know, the, the best way to, to curb as many of these, uh, Ex- uh, exacerbating factors as you can definitely will help any kind of food allergens that may be a factor i want to avoid those um, but yeah and then you know, making sure you're taking the proper precautions like cole said with the moisturizers and uh, cleansers yeah benadryl is also an option um, along with hydroxyzine as, as far as oral antihistamines and they'll only help with the itching they're not going to help with the rash or whatever um, dermatitis you have just with that symptom. And I was talking to a patient who has this the other day and she was asking me if there's something better than, than Benadryl. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know if, you, I guess you could, cause she says it just puts her to sleep. Um, I'm like, I don't know. I guess you could use a non-drowsy antihistamine. It seems like it would work, but I don't think it's really been looked into. I think it's mainly hydroxyzine and Benadryl. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody should look into it. Uh, but along with avoiding things that can cause the breakouts, so um, clothing, I think you mentioned clothing, um, uh, cotton is comfortable. It can be layered in the winter, uh, but wool products should probably be avoided. That can exacerbate. Uh, you want to wash your clothing in a mild detergent without any bleach and without any fabric softener. Um, so you're usually looking at unscented um, uh, detergents there. And a lot of times they'll, they'll say something like mild or unscented or no, no fabric. I mean, no, um, um, whatever the not flavor f- fragrance, no, no flavor fragrance. in this. You, you can Tell drink, you can drink as much flavor. as you want. You won't have any flavor. <laughs> Tide pot. Well, I mean, Tide pods probably have a flavor. Don't eat those. I hear that. Yeah. That's actually becoming a, a big problem. Yeah. I, I think hopefully it's coming on, but, um, cool temperatures, so that can matter. So if, if you argue with your wife over the uh, thermostat, but you have atopic dermatitis, and you can say, hey, it needs to be on 68. I, I was talking to my brother. I think he keeps it on like 64. Oof. Craziness. So we, we keep our house down like that too. Yeah, well, you have a huge dog. Yeah, and I think what he needs. <laughs> yes. That's my excuse. Yeah. Babe, listen. Look how comfortable he is. <laughs> He's sleeping so well. we laying on his back. <laughs> Ginormous. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, cool temperatures at night because sweating can um, cause irritation and itching. Um, and uh, I'm not looking at it right now, but I think I saw that swimming uh, in pools is actually can be helpful because it can be somewhat soothing. So um, on a hot day, sweating is no good. But if, if you're in the pool, then that's okay. And a lot of times you're dealing with babies that have this similar situation. So when I was talking about the baths, Three times a day uh, is not a great burden for an infant because, you know, a lot of times they're at home. But for an adult, um, those lukewarm, quick baths, probably once to twice is, is probably all you'll be able to, to manage unless you just stay at home a lot. Yep. So just to, I know we've kind of already beat this uh, topic up already, but um, there's a couple of moisturizers that I've never, never really heard of, but um, I figured I'd share them with you just to, because it's, they, they were looked at in this big meta-analysis that was conducted in 2017. Um, so this first agent, and this is the, they're, they didn't give a specific brand. I'm sure it wouldn't be, it would take a Google search to find out. And so I'll do that later, but um, they found that uh the moisturizers that contained, I'm going to butcher this, glycerhetinic acid, which is a, a natural anti-inflammatory agent, were four times more likely than uh, like a placebo vehicle um, uh, in reducing en- uh, enzyme, uh, eczema severity. Um, they also looked at urea, which you know we've seen. They don't say which percentage they were using, but um, that uh, seemed to be much better than the control cream as well. And then um, moisturizers that contained glycerol versus control. Um, patients in the glycerol group experienced significant skin improvement. Um, both when evaluated by the physician and the patient themselves. So a couple other things to throw in there just in case you're really trying to get sharp on your moisturizing skills. Yeah, it's a good thing to be sharp on. Yeah. Um, yeah, along with that, we mentioned foods. And um, so these patients are going to be at a higher risk for acute allergic reactions like hives and even anaphylaxis. So you want to be careful if you're introducing them to maybe a new food. If they're young, you're introducing them to a new food um, that's known for that, like peanuts, eggs, seafood, milks, um, other chocolates. 
uh, I had a patient that had a, a anaphylactic milk allergy one time. So I was having mm. to um, check and basically see, look at the ingredients and see if there was any lactose or lactulose or anything like that in any medication we were giving. And it turns out that's in like everything. Um, so yeah, be aware of that. And uh, interestingly, if you're going to eat maybe a, um, a uh, mildly caustic food, like a tomato, an orange, um, those citrusy foods, you and it causes your mouth to break out. You could uh, put some petroleum jelly kind of as a barrier around your mouth, around your lips as you eat the food and enjoy wonderful um, tomatoes and oranges. There you go. <laughs> that's just a, that's a, that was actually a recommendation that I read. It's, it's interesting. Good, it's a good one. Yeah. All right, so um, you know, let's let's kind of get into the actual medication-wise, uh, you know, treatment options. And um, the first one that obviously we would think about is our topical steroids, mm-hmm. our corticosteroids. Um, so it really, because there's so many in the market, um, and they're kind of uh, grouped based on their potency. It's one of the few times I think that we actually use the word potency when we're talking about different classes of medications. And so, um, corticosteroids, it goes all the way from low potency, all the way to super high, um, and you know, everything in between. So there's, um, depending on how severe the patient's uh, dermatitis is, so if it's mild, you can get away with, you know, one of the lower potency steroids. Um, and then all the way, obviously, if it's a severe, um, outbreak, then they probably want to use more of a high potency steroid, um. There's uh to kind of think through like the the different ones to give you some examples, um a something considered like super high potency would be like zero point zero five percent beta methadone dipropionate, um that uh, comes as ointment gels lotions, um diproline is the brand name and that would definitely be one. Um, there's also clobetazole, uh, the zero point zero five percent is also a super uh, high potency group one steroid. And then they kind of just go down from there. So um, to give you an example of like a medium, you know, mid-range, um, usually thinking like triamcinolone, like 0.1%, um, mometazone, something like that. Mm-hmm. And you'll probably see Kenalog. That's triamcinolone, pretty common. Yeah. Um, lower to, to, to lower to mid-potency, um, maybe like a uh, flucinolone acetate, acetide. Um, there's also... Um, you know, continuing to go lower, the, the basically the least potent we would have our over-the-counter hydrocortisone, like our 1% or 0.5%. Which a lot of times that is where you start if, um, you know, they're new to this and you, this is the initial therapy with a topical steroid, which usually, first off, like we said, you're doing moisturizers, but you're also doing steroids at the same time. So you would start with a hydrocortisone, preferably ointment, um, and you can apply it two times daily to the lesions um, on the face and in the folds. Yes, what it says, and uh, you know they do make a hydrocortisone two point five percent, which is a little bit higher potency. Um, not a high, but higher than the lowest one on the on the totem pole. Yeah, I think the max OTC is the one, is one. 1%. Yeah, so if you're in a, like a clinic situation, obviously, if you want to go with hydrocortisone, make sure you write a prescription for two point five percent to get them um, the higher strength. But yeah, over the counter options like Cole said, just one percent available. Um, patients with um, moderate to severe disease that probably need to start with a uh, more potent um, corticosteroid like triamcinolone at least, maybe even betamethasone. Um, if you are going to do this, the high potency steroids, though, two to four weeks is typically your your cutoff period um, because after that you can start increasing the uh, skin irritation. And even there's a, there's a risk for atrophy with the mm-hmm. higher the potency for the longer the use. Um, skin can actually start to atrophy and so areas of the body that already have very thin skin uh, that poses a problem especially when it's a growing child um, right. you've probably seen stretch marks especially in somebody who um, had their growth spurt maybe late or just had it really fast uh, if their skin is thin and they're still growing then a lot of times they'll have stretch marks that almost look like scars um, and that can last throughout their life. So you want to be aware of that. So it's really a lot of times, especially when they're having a flare, so you want to apply it just to the lesions. This isn't like a whole body situation. Um, and then if the lesions disappear, you can hold the steroids, keep going on the moisturizers, uh, and then resume the steroids if the patches or lesions reappear for a flare. Um, and they've also noted in certain, like, there's a meta-analysis that came out looking at the effectiveness and the different adverse effects 
and when they saw that when and this is especially uh, the case when you're using high or super high potency steroids in on large body areas so like the whole torso the legs things like that um, you can actually run the risk of getting enough systemic absorption to where you can have some adrenal suppression so almost mm. like a, a cushing syndrome type situation that's a lot of top steroids. Of steroid. Um, and frequently you'll see to avoid certain areas like the eyes, the mouth, genitals, that sort of thing. There was a, a big study in the Netherlands that uh, looked at the use of topical corticosteroids around the eyelids and the periorbital regions. And they determined it was actually safe with respect to inducing glaucoma or cataracts. Um, so hopefully uh, that's safe, but I would still, you know, if you don't have to put it in those areas, just avoid it and wash your hands after, after applying. So that's steroids. That is steroids. So those are the two two most common ones. Um, before we get into these next ones, it's probably going to need to be a pretty severe case um, that's causing the patient a lot of issues. Yeah. Right. And so another option that you can go with is the topical um, calcium inhibitors, which we have two of them on the market right now. The, the cheapest option being tacrolimus protopic. Um, the uh, second one is the Eldil cream. I think Eldil is still brand name only. Um, yes, as far as I know. But uh, those are two. That I think I feel like I've seen that. No, it's it's. I mean, it's it's brand. You're right. It's brand. Okay. Still. So um, those are going to be a non-steroidal immunomodulating agent. Um, so they're not going to cause the same uh, risks for skin atrophy, um, and they can be be used as an alternative. So. Uh, the good thing is, is you can use these on the face, the eyelids, the neck, skin folds, um, without worrying about the same adverse effects as, as steroids. Um, still applied twice a day, just like steroids. Um, and the Zacrolimus is actually coming down in price now that it's generic and uh, not too terrible. Eladel was still pretty outrageous at one point, but um, Tecrolimus is not too bad. Yeah, and these are great. Um, they compared them to placebo and hydrocortisone 1, and they were better. Uh, but like Mike said, little absorption occurs. So uh, other side effects from oral calcineurin inhibitors, you're not really concerned about with these, which is great. Uh, you can have some topical side effects. So a stinging sensation is pretty common following initial application. Uh, it can be minimized by applying to dry skin um, and not so much to wet skin. So this is a little different than those moisturizers. But usually the burning will disappear in about two to three days. And... Um, It'll be better after after that. The the tacrolimus comes in two strengths: the 0.1 percent, which is usually for adults, and 0.03 percent for children. Um, though it is frequently the 0.1 percent is frequently used in children as well. Uh, but that's I think what they're technically supposed to be used for. And they um they they compared it to, like Cole said to hydrocortisone and it was actually a little bit better. They've they've also com you know compared it to things like triamcinolone. And so um, it was seen to be about as good as that. And so when we're thinking about these, think about them as having efficacy around the mid-range uh, corticosteroids because they, they looked at it against betamethasone, which is one of our more potent steroids, and uh, it was less effective. So um, good to know. You know, it's one of those things that you got to have to put it in perspective compared to the steroids, but um, definitely a very good option. And, and I've seen patients that... Um, really have severe eczema on the face and and um, other sensitive areas where this is a much better option for them than the steroid because it just keeps coming back and they keep having to use something. So yeah, um, did you mention already the black box warning on these? No, I was about to. But you okay, go, go, you for go it. ahead. Nope, it's all you. Fine. I know how much you love black box warnings. Yeah. So um, there is a black box warning on there about a possible link to cancers, um, in particular lymphoma and skin cancer. So. Um, I don't have the exact statistics as far as what got that uh, black box warning put on there, but it's rare. Um, and you know, something that probably isn't a huge concern if, if the benefits are going to outweigh that risk enough, but uh, definitely a conversation that you need to have with the patient. Yeah. The patient sure needs to be aware. aware. And that's why it's important just to use it in the people who are indicated. So that would be uh, uh, for, for pimacrolimus, it would be mild, um, atopic dermatitis in patients older than two years. And then in, with tacrolimus, more of a moderate to severe picture, also patients older than two years. So under two, we're avoiding these. And after you've tried the first line steroids, that's usually when you'd want to go to these. Yeah. And they, they haven't officially 
uh, define this causal causal relationship. Um, I just saw that found the data now where um, it was basically case reports from 2004 to 2009. Um, they received 46 new cancer cases among children zero to 16 years old um, who had used one of these two agents. Um, they had 30 lymphomas, leukemias. They had eight different types of skin cancers um, or eight skin cancers rather that were reported and then eight other cancers. So um that's kind of where that black box warning comes from so i wonder not, how many not, that was 46 out of what you know yeah I, it's like probably a lot yeah but nah it doesn't matter versus the regular you know versus the lay public who you know you could you could argue that atopic dermatitis i would like to see it you could argue that the atopic dermatitis picture might put them at increased risk for cancer i'd be interested to see um what it is compared to patients who have that and who did not use the calcineurin inhibitors, but and there's there's something called the Pediatric Eczema Elective Registry, the PEER, um, which is an industry sponsored um, ongoing cohort that uh, they're using to study this post marketing. So um, check them out. If you have a uh, case that you find out about, go ahead and send it in to be reported. Call them out. Report Call them it. out. Yep. So those are the calcineurin inhibitors. There are other things. Um, such as with so many other conditions, we have monoclonal antibodies we can use. Uh, so dupalum, dupumlum, man, I said it, it right in my head earlier. That was good. Uh, really but good. It, it starts with a D and it ends with a MAB. Uh, it's monoclonal antibody and it inhibits IL-4 and IL-13 uh, signaling uh, by blocking the IL-4RA. And uh, it's demonstrated efficacy in some phase two clinical trials. It was approved pretty recently in 2017. Uh, the trials were the SOLO1 and SOLO2 trials. Um, and it's actually a subcutaneous injection. It's administered every two weeks. Um, dupilumab. I said it. There you go. Crushed it. That's all I needed to do for today. <laughs> dupilumab. I'm out. There you go. You did great, Cole. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, there is also uh, Eucrisa, which I'm sure you've seen the commercials for. They do a pretty good job about advertising. Um, but it is Eucrisa. Um, Eucrisa boral is a boron-based small molecule phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. Sounds um, familiar. Yeah. So um, you may uh, also know that the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, like um, Otesla, is the oral agent they use in psoriasis. Um, I've heard of some dermatologists using that even like very off top, like off label for eczema as well, um, without too much success. But I have yeah, heard we, about it. We can recycle this joke from the psoriasis episode. It's not a PDE five inhibitor. Uh, get it? Because PDE fives are used for something different. They are. Good job, Mike. <laughs> yep, I get it. <laughs> Anyways, um, the uh, the Eucrisis is out there as well. Um, you know, as far as its efficacy, it's kind of uh, expensive. Border. It's expensive <laughs> for what you get, um, and you know, the, a lot of the, the the studies that were done, you know, they used the scoring assessment to kind of show that it was um, effective. But um, from what I've heard, certain dermatologists kind of complaining that it's not for the price. It's not all that effective. Well, they got a pretty good advertising campaign because literally on this web page, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, ten, ten Eucrisa banner ads in my face. And it says, choose steroid free Eucrisa. Mm. So it's not a steroid. It's not. It is not. Ad. And they want you to know it. How many times have you clicked a banner ad in the last five years? <laughs> when have you noticed it if we haven't been talking about it? Oh, uh, it's sad. Still using the wrong kind of advertising. Mm hmm. Mm-mm-mm. Well, they're on TV too. Yeah, that's even worse. Whether or not that's good advertising, exactly. Yeah, you know us, you know us 2019 people. We like our commercials. <laughs> Oh, wait, I can fast forward through all the commercials? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Terrible. Anyways, well, we're, start, we're starting our uh, marketing podcast <laughs> very soon. Podcast is, is where it's at. That's where you want to advertise. Hint, hint. Yeah, <laughs> get it, guys? <laughs> Wink. Wink. Yeah, probably not. Not, like, not. not ours, obviously, a good podcast. Um, all right. Yeah, complications. We talked about them uh, a little bit. Super potent steroids, skin thinning. Uh, you can have tachyphylaxis, so um, big word for a, more or less a tolerance to topical steroids as well. Um, so a lot of times you'd want to use them on a more of a stop-start basis, like we said. That's just another reason for it. And then infections. Yeah. Staph infections, specifically. Uh, and super infection, staph infections, which I feel like is just another word for 
opportunistic infections, but um, I like super infection. Yeah, it, those, that's cool. Those are the best kind of infections. They were capes. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but treat them like you would a regular staph infection. You got options like um, what? Bactrim. Yeah. Well, if, if you're gonna be outpatient, Bactrim, Doxy, Clinda, yeah. inpatient, Vanco, Lenazolid. Anything covers MRSA if you're concerned. Um, so yeah, so, you know, there's other things we can do too is, you know, as far as a maintenance and prevention of relapses, there's been a few different, um, dosing strategies that have been looked at. Um, one in particular, there was a meta-analysis that looked at four different studies, um, looking at topical fluticasone propionate. Um, they used it once daily for two consecutive days per week for 16 weeks. Um, and it reduced the risk of subsequent flare by about 54%. Um, no serious adverse effects were reported um, during that study. So um, there's a few other ones like that as well. Um, Tacrolimus they have did for once daily for two to three days per week for 10 to 12 months, reduced the flares by 22%. Um, so th- there's definitely some interesting... Uh, interesting ways of, of hopefully preventing one of these relapses and flare-ups. But, um, you know, if you see for pharmacists out there, if you see a prescription for something kind of odd like that, um, that might be what they're, what they're treating or preventing from happening. Yep. And prescribers out there, if you want to do something that would be unusual, then do that. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Speaking of fluticasone, did we talk about Advair going generic? Mm-hmm. We did. And we talked about Pro and Ventolin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, never mind. Yeah, two episodes ago, because I made and I talked about the joke that Richard posted about it on Instagram. What was the joke? Like some picture of the guy seeing it. He pretended like it was like a somebody walking, like a you guys like cat calling a female, uh-huh. like walking by, and those supposed oh, to be oh, there. Yeah. And then the the prior authorizations were like pushing the guy back, like no chance. How quickly we forget. Well, you forget. <laughs> my memory. You, you remember it verbatim. My memory is actually a very solid. Mike remembers his jokes. He doesn't remember anything I say, but yeah. if he makes a good joke, he remembers. Oh, them. I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's also uh, phototherapy as well, oh, where yeah. they use ultraviolet light um, and uh, can in, in broadband UV light. There's several different ways of doing it, but um, that has also shown to be um, effective in controlling the, the disease as well. And if you have patients who uh, like the more natural path, like oil of evening primrose, <laughs> um, man, do I! It was previously believed to be effective, but. Uh, randomized controls, some RCSs, um, didn't show any benefit in children and little improvement in adults. So probably not the best. Yeah. Probably rather just do some OTC hydrocortisone if you want to stay OTC. I agree. Um, let's, there's also a couple uh, new studies that, that came out recently. There was one in January this year uh, where they looked at melatonin. Mm. Um to help, you know, which is usually used for regulating sleep and circadian rhythms, which um, I've I've seen several recent studies that say that that's complete nonsense. It's complete placebo effect when you take it like that. Got but a prescription today for melatonin, three milligrams, three times a day. Oh, interesting. Or no, sorry, three at bedtime, so nine megs. Oh, well, that makes more sense. Yeah, it looks makes a little more sense, but still, so a, bo- it's a whole bunch. It's a whole bunch. Um, but it does apparently have some antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties as well. And so they did a study, um, again, January 2019, where they randomized 70 different children that had atopic dermatitis um, and gave them melatonin 6 milligrams an hour before bed for six weeks. Um, And they were allowed to continue their usual treatment with topical steroids or emollients or whatever it was. Um, Children with the melatonin group had a greater improvement in the total scoring atopic dermatitis score. SCORAD um, from baseline and uh, total children's sleep habits questionnaire score also was improved, but um, not in the Paretta score. Um, treatment was well tolerated. No adverse effects were reported. Um, however, as atopic dermatitis is a chronic disease, obviously requiring further studies would be needed is what they kind of concluded on up to date. Um, you know, this, the safety data is pretty solid on melatonin, probably not going to cause any problems, but, um, yeah, at least they're they're looking at it for this. I it's one of those things. I I don't know that it would help much. That's a super small study, and there's a lot more information we would need. But uh, it's probably not going to hurt anything. So it's interesting, especially for people. I mean, I know people who try a whole bunch of stuff, and they don't like taking meds, and or uh, the the meds they've been taking haven't been working that great. So who knows? It's worth a shot, I guess. Yeah, 
Um, I've heard some people say uh, probiotics can yes, be helpful. Yes, I read about that too. So in December 2018, there was a study published, a big meta-analysis that had 39 different studies. Um, they looked at patients with mild all the way to severe, um, and then they were basically looking at the ones that had been given lactobacillus or um, bifidobacterium species and uh, or placebo and kind of looked at the severity of atopic dermatitis, sleep loss, quality of life, um, pruritus, all that. Um, there was a modest reduction of uncertain clinical significance is how it was labeled <laughs> um, for the uh, scoring atopic dermatitis score um, in patients that were taking the probiotics. But uh, they basically concluded by the end of the study that it is not effective. Mm, there you go. December 2018. Don't waste your money. They seem to be just the wonder drug these days because everybody's, everybody's like, well, you know, gut bacteria just is involved in everything. But I don't know. Yeah. I'm, we're waiting and seeing. And while we're at it, Montelukast. Yeah. Let's do it all. <laughs> Let's do it all. I'm going to go through all these studies since there was like four other ones that have been updated recently. Um, basically, long story short, November 2018, uh, another big meta-analysis that looked at five different studies, um, concluded that Montelukast did not decrease symptoms or decrease paritis, any of that. So mm. not effective. That's unfortunate because these patients are almost always put on it because they frequently have the asthma allergy picture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's like, ooh, here we go, singular, yeah. bang, asthma allergy. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of so, wish it would help. Not, yeah, well. Wishing's not going to do anything, <laughs> is it, Mike? Yeah, wishing's not science, so <laughs> let's go on from there. I'm just kidding. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, definitely right. There's going to be patients that are taking it, but it's not really going to necessarily help with their atopic dermatitis specifically. No. But yeah, that's uh, the, the newest and latest news that have come out in these big meta-analyses. Heard it here first, folks. Yeah, unless you read other stuff like UpToDate. <laughs> unless you you're, it there unless first. you're up to date on your information. <laughs> then you didn't hear it here first. Then you already know what we're talking about. What else? What else did we miss? Anything? That's all I got. I didn't think we were going to be able to go that long on this one. Phew. We did good. Crushed it. Yeah. It's called <laughs> preparation. Yeah. Well, something like that. Mike may or may not be teaching on this tomorrow, so hopefully he's I am. I actually this is my preparation right here. There you go. And it's done. Students, uh, I'm gonna peace out tomorrow, just listen to our podcast. Yeah, that's very good. Just and play. Yeah. <laughs> Class well, is a little short today. That's only gonna be like forty five minutes. You just need to um you just need to get like a, a, a fat head of mm -hmm. yourself and like post it on the wall mm. and then put a, a monitor right where your face is. Mm-hmm. And then play the like the 360 video. They'll literally never. They would never know the difference. Never. Yeah, just give it some big muscles and a beard, wow. and then you're good to go. Yeah, <laughs> it's a solid move. Don't even need to teach. Solid move. There's no way that could backfire. Sleeping on me. in tomorrow. No, actually, I'm me. And my students are at 6 a.m. What? It's nonsense, right? Why? Well, because a lot of them said they wanted extra help outside of class, and so I was like, all right, let's see who's game. 6 a.m. Bunch of them said they would show up, so we'll see. Mike Corvino goes the extra mile. It's not that. I just want to see what people are made of. <laughs> yeah, just, just testing them. Just really want to see what people are made of. And if I, and then, see you if know, they got the sauce. They, they stand up and get there. I'm like, all right, these people are a game. It's they gonna, want to learn. It's going to be uh, it's gonna be pants time for them soon, right? Yeah. Uh, no, well, that's the first class I taught. This is all brand uh, okay. new PA students. Has your has your first class taken the pants yet? Mm -mm. Okay. Huh. Nope. Interesting. Hopefully yep. it goes well. Stay tuned. If they all fail, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> we'll blame Clint Med or something else. Yeah. <laughs> I was never there. But yeah. Anyways, now that I've given you some insight on how I teach and <laughs> y'all are very concerned. <laughs> concerned. These patients. I mean, these, these people. <laughs> these poor students. These students. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think we are uh, going to wrap it up today, but we will definitely be continuing on in, uh, with our random topic series of, <laughs> of podcasts. Episode 59. And uh, we, I've actually, we've thought, I haven't told Cole this, so I'm surprising him now, but I've actually thought about doing like an MTM episode for community pharmacists since cool. both of us have some experience with that. Let's and so I have a couple of community pharmacists on social media that are uh, gauging different, um, forums and things like that that from different community pharmacy uh groups on facebook and, and getting us ideas so cool i think we're gonna be doing mtm here pretty soon awesome yeah they're not scary guys they're really not it's not bad at all you know what to talk about you just talk to the people sometimes they they ask why you're calling because they haven't used your pharmacy in three years but it's okay yeah oh you well where's the where's sometimes the they think that you're a scam artist trying to get information from them my first call on mike's rotation the poor lady thought that 
Yes. My Didn't first I call. warn you about that? Or were you the case study that I used to warn people? I think that well, it had happened before, but after it happened, you you mentioned it. Yeah. She she really thought that I was um, was trying to steal her information. She was very upset. She did not believe that I was co- I was she this was person te- I calling from this te- place. She was testing you. She was <laughs> like, what's my doctor's address? Yeah, yes. And and I didn't have the computer up in front of me, so I'm hollering at you. I'm like, Mike, who's her doctor? <laughs> and she did not believe me. But then once I said who her doctor was, she was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, here's all my information. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah, it was good. Good times. Yeah. I forgot about all that. Mm-hmm. Cole also set the record for, uh, I told him that, like I guess he started rotation like on a Thursday, so we had two days left in the you know quote unquote week, and uh, yeah, I think the record at that time because we, we were in a really busy store, so we didn't get that much time to do uh, MTMs and things like that. But the record I think was like it was something like nine hundred dollars or something for mm-hmm. that for the week for mm-hmm. my from student claims, and um, they uh, had, I told him I was like, hey man, you know you're not going to beat that obviously this week, but. You know, next week I think you guys will you guys definitely have a shot. And him and the other student on rotation, Stacy, they disappeared for 15 hours straight. Didn't hear from him. Came back later at 10 o'clock at night. Cole walks back in the pharmacy. Hadn't taken a break all day. And he was like, all right, 1,258, whatever the heck it was. Well, we said challenge accepted. So I'm calling people up at 930 at night for yeah, It was hilarious. Why I was are like, you oh my gosh. I want to talk about your drugs. Wake up. We have to talk right <laughs> now. I have a goal we got to important things to do. So in one day, he crushed the, other, the last record that was all week. That was so fun. It was brutal. And I was like, right then and there, Core Console DRX podcast <laughs> yeah, was born. That's, that's the inception. Yeah. You heard it here first. Boom. Coming of age tale. All right. Let's wrap it up. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, if you like the podcast, please uh, make sure you subscribe. Leave us a rating on Facebook. That helps us. Or not Facebook, rather. Uh, iTunes uh, or any of the other podcast platforms you may listen to. Helps us out a lot. Especially those jokers that leave one star ratings. Ooh, Mike's going to talk those, about it those every sting. single time. <laughs> Come on, guys. We need your help. <laughs> I got people that are targeting us with one star. You can't even give us two stars, really. <laughs> well, it's just that one person. Yeah, that was another one. It no happened, way. Yeah, this past week, someone was no like, I hate way. this so much. I'm giving it one star. I'm going to take the time to find out where I need to rate it and give it one well, star. Well, it's, it's pro- there's probably people who just go around to every podcast and just do one. They're just that type of person. You know, that's their personality. They're just going to one star every single podcast just to spite the world. Maybe. I don't know. Either that our podcast is terrible. It's it, could be, it very well could be that. It might be that. So if you guys do, on the off chance you guys actually like it, make sure <laughs> <laughs> make sure that you leave us a rating. It helps us out a lot. And um, we will definitely... Uh, try our best to answer any questions, emails, anything like that that we get. And if we don't, if you don't hear back from us soon after you write an email, give us a little bit. We try to go back and reach out to everybody, but sometimes we get a little backed up. So um, we will definitely do our best to reach out to y'all. Thank you guys so much for the emails we have gotten, the comments, um, suggestions have all been super great. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate you listening. So we will catch you next time. Y'all take it easy.